Easter is such a well-known religious holiday that even, even people who don't attend church or weren't raised in church, they still have an understanding of what Easter is. Most of them could tell you uh, this guy named Jesus of Nazareth died on a Roman cross as a common criminal. And then on the third day, on Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. And that's what Christians celebrate on Easter. Much like communion can become a little bit too routine for us if we're not careful. I think even though it only comes once a year, Easter can be the same way. Oh yeah, yeah, I went to church on Easter and the guy talked about an empty tomb and then we went and had a nice dinner. What I want to do today is kind of just try to take a fresh look at it. Easter is huge. The empty tomb changes everything. And so I just kind of want us to take a fresh look at it. I want us to re-energize ourselves with the idea that the tomb was empty, that he is risen, that he is alive no more to die. I'm going to start us off with a little scripture. Rael read for us this morning the resurrection account in the Gospel of Luke. All four Gospels contain a resurrection account because it's so critical. Um, each one's slightly different in just the way they view it, in the pieces of the story they tell. We read Luke's this morning. After that, in, in the, book of, uh, the Gospel of Luke, there's a story where uh, Jesus, resurrected from the grave, walks with some of his followers or students, not, not the 12 disciples, but still people who had been students of his. Uh, he walks with them to a certain place, and then he eats with them. And, and when he begins to eat, they realize who it is. And they're stunned, and they run. We think it was about six miles. They run back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what they had seen. The women, of course, had already told the disciples what they had seen. So we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, you say you've seen him and you say you ate with him and you say you've seen him. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened. That's probably putting it mildly, huh? But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet that it is I myself touch me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. He's back. He's real. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. In other words, everything in the Old Testament. Remember, they didn't have the New Testament at this point. So he's literally saying everything in what you call the Bible must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. As he had walked around the countryside, this rabbi, this preacher from Nazareth, relatively poor and unknown, he had begun to create some commotion. And at one point he asked his disciples, who am I? Who do the people say that I am? They're like, oh, it's all over the board, man. Some of them think you're this prophet Elijah come back. And some of them think maybe John the Baptist has been brought back to do something that he didn't finish or whatever. We're not real sure. Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ. And so there was this idea in their head they sort of knew. But think about that claim. This is what God, this is what Jesus, I'm sorry. This is what Jesus was saying. You know, the eternal God, he's always existed in that direction. He'll always exist in that direction. You know, the eternal God that created everything, I am he. You know, the God that the Bible says is so amazing and so awesome that he's unsearchable and ultimately unknowable. That's me. 
You know the Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament that's going to conquer and he's going to reign from Jerusalem forever. That's me. Those are massively bold claims to make. And of course, some of the religious leaders of the day were getting a little bit agitated. Wait a minute. You're actually saying that your God, the eternal, unsearchable, unknowable, powerful entity that created everything. You know everything. You've always existed and always will. Yes, that's what I'm saying. We don't like that. That's blasphemy. That's who Jesus claimed to be. Man, is that bold. Now, there had been others who had claimed to be the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament. In the book of Daniel, it speaks about there's these earthly kingdoms that will battle out for dominance, but ultimately God will bring a kingdom from on high and one like a son of man will crush those other kingdoms and he will sit enthroned by God and reign forever. And there had been people fairly recently even to Jesus and immediately after him as well. They claimed that they were that Messiah. And almost every one of them was either snuffed out by the religious leaders of the day, or they were executed by the Romans when they tried to stir up too much trouble. But Jesus is saying, I'm the Messiah. And it's even a little bit farther than that. I'm God in the flesh. As if that weren't bold and crazy enough for a poor kid from Na Nazareth is exactly nowhere. And in fact, if you read in the scriptures, there's one person who says, uh, I'm not sure anything good could come from Nazareth. This was a very religious person, by the way. I'm not sure anything good could come from Nazareth. I seriously doubt God's going to bring his Messiah out of a dirt hole in Galilee. But not only did Jesus say, I am the Messiah. Check this out. He said, and given that, you need to recenter your entire life around me. Your life is no longer your life. I want your life to be my life. I created you. I'm going to die to redeem you. And I'm going to need you to recenter your life around me. You're going to need to put me in charge. You're going to need to walk every day to please me, to glorify me, not to satisfy you. All right, so wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Your mom and daddy are nobodies. Correct. My mama was a poor, illiterate teenager who got pregnant out of wedlock. And my earthly father is dead and you're poor and you have no political connections to the Romans and you're from the tribe of Judah, but you still have very little standing in the Jewish community. And I'm supposed to believe that you're God. And given that, I'm supposed to give up all my life, all my goals, all my dreams and turn around, change my direction, follow you and put you at the center of my life. Now you got it, Jesus said. Here's the problem. When you make big, bold claims, and you demand big, bold action, you better be able to back it up, right? Any nut job off the street could come in here, stand in the foyer and go, I'm the Messiah. And what would we say? Prove it. If you're going to make big, bold claims that require big, bold commitments, you better be able to back it up. As we read before, and as we've talked before in this service, the way that God validated his messengers really consisted of two main things. They would perform miracles and they would make prophecies that always came true. And false religions would try miracles, but they wouldn't work. And false prophets would make predictions about things, but they wouldn't come true. And God told Moses in Deuteronomy 18, you'll always know my prophets because their prophecies will come true. So if you're going to make a big, bold claim and ask for a big, bold commitment, you better make some big, bold prophecies and you better make, you better perform some big, bold miracles. I've only really got two points for us this morning. And here's the first point. Jesus did, in fact, validate his claims to lordship with what I call the most astonishing miracle ever performed, wrapped up tightly in the most unlikely prophecy ever foretold. Let me break them down for you. Jesus says, guys, we're going into Jerusalem. And as we get in there and Jerusalem's whipped up for the Passover feast and the religious leaders are already uneasy, the Romans are always on edge when Passover comes. We're going to go in there and it's going to get stoked to a height and they're going to kill me on a cross. 
That ain't much of a prophecy. Everybody that he claimed to be Messiah that rolled in on a horse to Jerusalem, Rome stripped him and nailed him to a cross. Usually on a public thoroughfare to dissuade anybody else from such foolish notions. That's not the prophecy Jesus made. Jesus said, I'm going to die on a cross and you're going to see me stone cold dead. Dead as a brick. You're going to see the fluid has just come out of my body. You're going to see them take me off the cross and you're going to see that my joints are already getting stiff. And the few of you that touch me as you wrap me up to put me in the grave are going to feel that I'm already cold. I'm dead. I'm gone, Roman executed, dead. And they're like, well, yeah, if we kick up too much of a fuss, Jesus, we could see that happen. He said, hold on, I'm not done talking. It ain't your turn yet. Watch this. And then in three days, gentlemen, Big Daddy's coming back to life. That's a prophecy. Wait, whoa, whoa. Who's going to bring you back? We know who brought Lazarus back to life. You did. Because you claim to be the Messiah. And because God is agreeing with you that you're the Messiah, God allows you to do things like bring Lazarus back from the dead. But if you're the one dead, who's going to bring you back? Jesus said, boy, am I glad you asked. I am He. I'm bringing me back. Who do you think is bringing me back? Who can raise somebody from the dead? Jesus the Christ. Only God can do that. Who do you think is going to raise me from the dead? You want a prophecy? You want me to prove my claim? You want me to validate my lordship, my messiahship, my kingship? How about this? Here's a prophecy. I'm going to poke Rome in the eye until they kill me. And you and everybody in Jerusalem is going to know I am dead. And then they're going to put me in a hole in a rock and they're going to leave me there so that even if there had been any breath in my life, it sure wouldn't have lasted. And on Sunday morning, I'm going to freak you out. The Bible says, but they were startled and frightened. Come on, Luke, you can do better than that. And Jesus himself stood among them and they were freaked the jack out. They were running for the halls. They were going to the bathroom. I'm going to walk out of the tomb and I'm going to come pay you a visit. There's my prophecy. There's my prophecy. You know what? It's a miracle when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. It would have been a bigger deal if Lazarus had raised himself, wouldn't it? The most astonishing miracle ever performed. Let me ask you something. If it had been anybody other than the Son of God, who is God the Son, if anybody other than the Son of God had died on that Roman cross on that Friday afternoon, you think he would have walked out of the tomb under his own power on Sunday morning? Ain't no way. You know how we know? Because hundreds of them did it. There was one false Messiah after another who were seeking fame and fortune and power, or they were just nuts. And Rome killed them ruthlessly and efficiently. And generally speaking, left their bodies on the cross for the birds and the wild dogs to eat. And we never heard from them again, and we never will. Jesus validated his lordship. Okay, so the claim is true then. The big, bold claim that the little poor kid from Nazareth made is true. Boy, well, don't you think... The disciples, as they're in that room, and they come to realize one by one, this really is him. And we're touching him, and he's eating stuff. Don't you think they started to think one by one? You know, when he said that he was God and the Son of Man from the book of Daniel, we kind of thought, you know, yeah, he, he is up here. Uh-uh. He's up here. There's no doubt when, the, when Jesus walked in that room. Now, another version of it says he didn't come through the door. The door was closed and the walls were sealed. And all of a sudden, Jesus is like, here I am, peace to you. They're like, peace nothing. You just scared the daylights out of us. One by one, it must have washed over them. Holy smoke. He validated his prophecy and he performed a crazy miracle. That's God. And when, Matt, when Thomas finally sees Jesus, what does he say? My Lord and my God. You are who you said you were. You are God. And given that, just like our two baptizees did this morning, I'm giving lordship of my life to you. 
There's nothing else that Christ could have done to have proved the claims that he was making beyond what he did. It's the craziest scheme I've ever heard of. It's the craziest scheme I've ever heard of. And that's going to take us to our second point here. Even before they saw the radical validation and authentication of Jesus' lordship, the disciples already had a pretty good understanding of who Jesus was and what Jesus planned on doing. He talked about reigning on a throne. Just the fact that he referred to himself as the Son of Man would have pointed to every serious religious person to the book of Daniel, where the Son of Man is given an eternal kingdom by God the Father. And so as you would expect humans to do, as they began to see that Jesus was claiming kingship and did plan on ruling from a throne in Jerusalem, they started jockeying for power. It's easy for us to point fingers at them now, but think about if this happened to you. Your mother, father, wife, husband, best friend, first cousin, next door neighbor calls you and says, this is the craziest thing that's ever happened. But the legislature just told me that I'm now the governor of Georgia. Wouldn't the first, come on now, the first thing your mom would do is say, how am I going to benefit from this? All right, first of all, I want to go down to the governor's mansion and hang out. I want to cook some barbecue in the backyard. Lalo, me and you, baby, come on. I want all my speeding tickets taken care of. I'm fixing to be going 300 miles an hour around 285, and I expect the governor to clear that for me. Right? That's just how humans think. And so his disciples thought, man, this is awesome. He chose us. We were a little nervous at first. We didn't understand. We wasn't sure who he was, but now we're starting to see it. And he's starting to do these miracles to validate that he is the Messiah, and God, instead of striking him dead, God just keeps backing him up one time after another after another. This dude's legit, this dude's legit, this dude's legit. This is it. What position can I have? And our two favorite disciples, the brothers, nicknamed by Jesus the Sons of Thunder, James and John, actually did what everybody else was thinking. Well, they didn't actually do it. James and John had their mama. Isn't that pitiful? James and John had their mama go to Jesus for them. Now, when I was in school, we made fun of kids like that. I mostly made fun of them, so they quit making fun of me about being a nerd. But nevertheless, I could get it to catch on pretty quick, mama's boy. James and John had their mama go, hey, Jesus, come here. You know my boy James and John? They're good, ain't they? Yeah, they're sweet and handsome, strong, smart. They doing all right? You tell me, I'll get them. Here's what I need. This whole sitting on a majestic throne in Jerusalem thing, I'm looking forward to that, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm team Jesus all the way. When you're sitting on that throne, can you put one of my boys on the right hand and one of my boys on the left hand? I can only imagine Jesus' expression when mama was asking him that. First of all, Jesus himself probably made fun of them for being mama's boys. James and John, come here. That's, that's pathetic. And I imagine Jesus tried to talk her down, but I bet she kept bargaining with him. Well, you see, ma'am, it's really not going to quite be the kind of kingdom that you're thinking about it. They, no, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. My husband owns his own business. Zebedee. See, like Peter and Andrew, they're good kids, but they're not like, they're not your quality. They worked for my husband as just hired hands. But James and John, they'll inherit. I mean, I can just hear her negotiating. And Jesus is just like, hey, and of course the other, the Bible tells us the other disciples were a little bit ticked off at James and John and their mama for doing that. And we don't blame them. And here's what Jesus had to be thinking. I've told these guys over and over that I am the Messiah. I am God. I am the son of man. And they're getting it, but they don't get it. And they get it and they don't get it. I need one final proof. I need a crazy miracle wrapped in an unlikely prophecy to push them over the edge. And I've been telling these guys, I'm not here to start a political kingdom where you get the power of being the governor's right-hand person. I'm here to start a kingdom where the greatest of these shall be the biggest servant and where the first shall be last. And where if you want to be the best, Jesus said, you have to be, check it, the slave of all. He had told them that and told them that and told them that. And I don't blame them. If I thought my sister was going to be the governor, I'd already be scheming. Now, if you've met my sisters, you know there is very little chance they're going to get a vote even from me. But <laughs> hypothetically speaking, 
if I thought my sisters was going to, one of my sisters was going to be the governor, first of all, I'd start being nicer to them, but I'd be thinking. And so were the disciples. They had come to believe this guy was going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem. Here's my second point. And this will pop up on the screen, I think. I truly believe that it took the shock of Jesus' personal sacrifice. I think it took the stunning event of Him dying on a Roman cross to reorder the apostles' priorities to straighten out the desires of their heart. And I think it worked because we see this game of individuals who had been at times timid and at times stubborn and almost always looking out for themselves. What do I get if I help bring the kingdom of God to fruition? What's in it for me? And we see that same group of men become these bold, selfless, giving servants. If I really want to convince you that you need to serve. No, no, but Andy, I believe that Jesus is the Christ and I believe that he's my Lord and I was baptized into him. You even saw it. What does it mean then to make Jesus your Lord? It means that you become the last, that you become the servant of all. How did Jesus impress that point on his followers? Let me give you guys the ultimate example of personal sacrifice for the benefit of others. Here's the problem. A dead example ain't much of an example. Jesus, we get what you meant. As we stood there and watched them take your dead body off that cross, we came to understand what you meant by service, by the first shall be last. We get it. We saw it in action. We understand. You literally gave everything for other people. And so you call me to do. But now you're gone. I have no more direction from you. And then up from the grave he arose. And these guys were ready to go. They're chomping at the bit. Right? It's totally different now. They believe, how could they not, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They're convinced. And now they know what it means to put Jesus as the Lord of their life. It means to serve others, even to the point of death on a Roman cross. It means to serve others. That's what I see in Easter this year. I said a fresh look or we want to take a fresh start. Our religion can become as stale as anything else in our lives. Our religion can become as routine as anything else in our lives. And Easter should be a time when we reinvigorate. And you know what? I bet the disciples would have gotten tired and as opposition came on them and family responsibilities and pressure, I think it would have been easy for them to back off. And here's what happens. They think about that empty hole in that rock and they say, I'm refreshed again. Jesus isn't calling me to do something he's not willing to do. Jesus isn't the next crazy guy that claims to be the Messiah. And that's what I want Easter to be for us. As we leave here today and we go enjoy our dinners with our families and we head out into next week, I want us to be refreshed. I want us to think about the empty tomb. What does the empty tomb mean? It means everything Jesus said is dead on God letting him walk out of that grave was perfect and definitive validation that Jesus is who he said he was and everything he said is right and everything he said is going to happen is going to happen and there ain't no sense in anybody ever questioning any of it again. And we all need to know that and believe in our heart as deeply as we can that God allowing him to walk out of that tomb was the ultimate validation. And if we believe that Jesus is the Christ and if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, we've only got one option. We have to try to become last. The first have to become last. And the greatest among you has to be the servant of all. What's our example for that? Our example for that is a king dying on a cross when he didn't have to die on a cross. That's our example for that. So the king is gone. I can't work in the kingdoms in the king's kingdom any longer. Oh no, no. The king ain't gone. 
The king is alive. The king is risen. We are working in his kingdom. And Jesus Christ reigns from heaven right now over his kingdom, the New Testament church. And newsflash, Jesus Christ, the son of man, will reign forever. God will take a giant stone and crush the kingdoms of the earth. And the son of man will reign forever. And what do you get out of the deal? What position do you get in the governor's mansion? Servant. Servant of all. Let me pray.